In this episode, you will learn how to create, deploy, and manage Node-RED applications in industrial IoT solutions for large-scale manufacturing enterprises. My guest on this episode is Nick Olerin. Nick is the CTO and founder of Flowforge Inc., a DevOps platform for Node-RED. He co-created the Node-RED project 10 years ago and continues to lead the project as part of the OpenJS Foundation. Before starting Flowforge, he worked across various technologies at IBM for over 19 years. Nick also contributes to the Eclipse Power project and he sits on the OSIS MQTT Technical Committee. This episode is made possible by our friends at HiveMQ who are providers of an enterprise MQTT platform. So please do check them out to help support this channel. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on industry 4 TV, which is a series of interviews designed to help you learn industrial IoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So if you are new here, please don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the interviews. Now, here is my interview with Nick. So Nick, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's a pleasure to have you on. So welcome. Thanks very much, Katai. Great to be here. Thank you. So today I would like to talk to you about Node-RED for industrial IoT uh, applications. So I I've been following uh, Node-RED and using it for a number of years now. And uh, it has been intriguing to watch it grow into different application domains, including industrial IoT. Now, to get started, can you tell us uh, what were the original intentions when you uh, kind of like created Node-RED and did you envision that it will grow to be this big? Uh, well, absolutely. So, I mean, Node-RED started just over 10 years ago now um, when I was working at IBM in our Emerging Technologies group and we were doing lots of um, very quick prototyping client projects, building real solutions for, for real clients across a wide range of domains. Um, but it tended to be the, the area I was more involved with was what we would come to know as IoT. So doing a lot of MQTT work. Um, yeah, this was back when MQTT was still only just getting known outside of IBM. Um, so uh, yeah, so for a lot of the sorts of projects we were doing, it would be very quickly, you know, grab some sensor data from one location, combine it with some data from somewhere else. Um, and it was just that sense of writing the same code each time for doing a lot of boilerplate type of activity. Um, so uh, it was, you know, that was sort of the background. And then um, the great thing about that team at the time was we were just given time and space to invent stuff as well, you know, actually play with technology and try and come up with new ideas. And I'd wanted to play around with the idea of graphically mapping MQ MQTT topics for ages from, from you know, previous roles when I'd worked on some of our MQTT implementations. And I thought, well, it, it felt like something worth playing with. And I just you know, very quickly cobbled together uh, a a demo of this idea of dragging on a node that represents an MQT topic and drawing a wire to represent where you want the messages to flow. And it, you know, within a couple of days, it just it just hit a spot of actually this is quite useful. <laughs> and over the course of days, the weeks after, um, you know, every couple of days we were just adding another node into the palette because they were, for a real client project, there was just something else we needed to attach to, to the flow. And um, you know, I think very much the fact that we were very quickly using it for real client um, projects. Um, yes, they were proof of concept type work. So you know, this wasn't intended at this stage to be production ready, but you know, having that sort of tool that lets us very quickly build, build a solution, prove a concept for a, a client proved super powerful. Um, and as I say, we happen, it happened to be the IoT domain that we were we were using it in but quickly you know colleagues in the department working across all other sorts of domains started playing with it trying it out and and finding value in in the, the projects they were doing so um yeah it was 
it started out as as a experiment you know something playing around with technologies an excuse for me to learn how to to build um, apps with the particular toolkits we were using uh but very quickly proved to be something actually worthwhile <laughs> and, and worth sticking with so um and then you know it kind of just led from there and it, it became very clear to us that um you know the, the strength of it was going to be uh what the nodes you have in the palette you know each node representing a system you can talk to or a bit of functionality um and you know we so we built it with that in mind built it make it super extensible and uh you know uh, managed to uh managed to get the support of of IBM for us to open source it and that you know that support came um came through very quickly and so we open sourced it uh later that year so it was only like six to eight months after first starting playing around with the idea open sourced it and just through our connections in the IoT meetup communities in London and and you know just through our, our social networks uh, people started finding it and people started playing with it and it, it has really just kind of exploded from there in terms of um, where it's led to yeah I, I never when I started I never really contemplated building a tool that would be as popular or as successful as no dread has proven um to at the start it was just a a tool to help us do our day job but also an excuse for me to play with some technologies and learn and you know I just think we we managed to hit a lot of the right um secret ingredients that that you don't always hit to turn it to create something that has proved much more successful much more valuable than I ever imagined oh that's interesting it's also for me interesting to learn that um MQTT was kind of like foundational in the creation of uh of not red so that's really interesting so again I think both those technologies kind of share a history where they were originally created for like uh connecting uh, uh plans or, or sensors and then they went into like the commercial uh, uh home automation kind of like mm -hmm. and then now I see it the post technologies coming back into the industrial IT uh, domain because I remember when I started playing around with not red I was kind of like getting a push back to say okay this is not this is not an industrial software we can't use this in the industry and uh I see more and more uh uh, uh people or companies warming up to the idea really of mm. using uh node red because of the power of uh, of node red but i would imagine there are still uh, challenges as far as uh node red uh using node red in industrial it use cases what what uh, do you see as being the major challenges of deploying node red in industrial it uh, environments mm. and, and and do you have any best practices on how to mitigate mm. those challenges so um I think a lot of the challenges, well, the, 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 yeah. as with adopting any solution in any environment, you know, you've got to, you've got to integrate into that environment well, and and that is more than just the technical integration. There's also the, you know, when you're looking at more corporate and more sort of commercial environments, you've got to consider, uh, it's not just about you know how you build an application or the sorts of applications you can build. It's about access control. It's about um, having um, audit logs of who changes what when there's there's how do you manage a proper development testing to production life cycle um yeah all, all those sorts of qualities that can apply to to any tool that an organization might choose to adopt um and certainly with node red in the early days you know it was kind of unproven in the sense that yes it was super popular and lots of people were using it for personal projects but again as with any tool companies who want to adopt it kind of want to have some uh build confidence in it that it this is suitable for for their environment and and again that that is what we've seen with the adoption of node red over the years is more and more companies adopting it and each company that adopts it just has added confidence to the community that actually no you know, node red is suitable for this type of application um so um and it's quite funny a lot of the conversations we tend to have are people who have already tried out node red and they they kind of already see the value of bringing node red into their industrial environment they may already have um you know almost like skunk work project on the side just because it's so easy to get started and and it 
doing what it's it does well um but then they want to transition to more you know formal footing and often when you want to do that as i say the, the challenges tend to be more organizational and um the need to have uh to have a vendor that you can actually point at and say look if we're going to rely on this technology for our for our business we want to have a vendor who can actually supply it and back it and yeah this is a challenge for all open source projects um that that uh, exist in their own right um yeah there's for all the strengths of open source there are still companies who are uh reluctant to adopt a pure open source solution where it's going to be critical to their business um because if there is a bug you know how you know who do they who do they go and phone at when their production system is down because of a bug in an open source. So, um, you know, this is this is kind of the space we're at with with the Flowforge company um, that I'm at now, where we are sort of trying to provide that a uh, more uh, enterprise ready environment for for running Node Red and address a lot of those challenges with Node Red, which, to be frank, aren't aren't necessarily about node red itself that it isn't about the flows you create and the applications you can build it's about how you integrate that into your environment interesting yeah so when i first uh, learned about um, your company flowforge so uh, uh, just to give context for some of, of our listeners here so uh, you founded a company called flowforge which is kind of like centered around uh, this idea of DevOps for Node Red. So for for me, when I first found out about uh, this initiative, I was kind of like uh, wondering what is uh, DevOps for Node Red. So maybe for mm -hmm. uh, for our audience here, uh, could you describe what that is? What is DevOps for 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 Node Red? And and again, maybe emphasize on why you think it's important for uh, companies who are embarking on industry on industrial IT to look at it. Absolutely. So. Um, you know, Node-RED is great at what it does, and but ultimately Node-RED is kind of this single user runtime. Um, if you want to build, uh, if you think about software development in, in other practices, you don't write your code in the live production system. You, you develop your code maybe locally. You might have a test environment where you validate what you've built, and then you manage rolling that out into your production system once you're assured of the quality of what you're rolling out yeah so the whole devops pattern is is you know a well well trodden well understood way of working in traditional software development um so what we're looking at with flowforge is trying to bring those practices and those ideas to a low code environment where the um you know the, the typical developer of a node red flow isn't necessarily a software developer. They might be you know, sort of more the industrial engineer who understands their their industrial systems. And yeah, you know, with Node Red, they can suddenly build far more powerful solutions without having to write code. But how do you bring the those sorts of best practices around um, developing in a you know, having a separate development environment? How do you transition from that environment into a production environment in a safe managed way that doesn't involve sort of co copy and paste of of from one browser window to another type of approach so um so that's the type of capability we're looking at with flowforge um build being able to create deployment pipelines so you can create and develop your applications in in one node red instance you can snapshot them you know take sort of uh, version control type type workflows with that and when you're happy with what you've got you can then push that out to your production node red instances in a more, much more managed way with audit logging so you know who's changed what who deployed what when and all those sorts of sensibilities which are again kind of common practice in in the devops world with normal software Oh, okay, interesting. So, I mean, as you have already uh, alluded to, uh, the, the the goal here is to kind of like enable enterprise ready Node Red. So, uh, what would you say are the features uh, that are key uh, for Node Red to be considered enterprise ready? So, I think we find the so the the core of Node Red um, and what it does is 
is enterprise ready. It, it works. And as I think I said, mentioned earlier, it's it is it's a, it's the pieces around the edge that you kind of need. So um, having good access control as to who can change what, um, so you can uh, restrict who has access to to change flows. I mean, when you look at lots of sort of secure standards like you know ISO. Uh, 27001 or SOC 2, all those sorts of security standards around how you manage your production systems, having good access control, having good audit logging. Um, these are all the sorts of features that, that enterprise look for um, with, with the software that they want to run in their environment. And then with Node-RED itself, looking at how can we improve things like high availability. So when you have a, a Node-RED instance that is uh, part of your production environment, how can we improve the general availability, whether that's through uh, scaling, so have multiple instances, spread work across multiple instances, improve, you know, improve the throughput, or just simply, you know, if a single Node-RED instance fails, how can we fail over to a, a spare instance to minimize the time to recovery between those instances. So it's it's a lot of those aspects, you know, just managing the node RAID infrastructure, managing the um the flows and how how they are rolled out into the environment. Yeah, so I mean uh, one of the uh, fundamental aspects, I mean, as even as already you have uh, pointed out in the introduction, that the fundamental aspect of node RAID really is about. Uh, uh, data collection, right, from sensors, or it could be uh, devices and equipment uh, in, in an industrial uh, IoT setting. Um, so uh, based on your experience, like having seen all of this uh, implementation going on, what do you have any best practices that you could share regarding the use of Node-RED for industrial uh, data acquisition? Um, so I think a common pattern we see is, uh, you know, a lot of PLCs, are fairly closed environments and you kind of have to uh you end up into a bit of a walled garden of where your data lives in your environment and you're kind of uh stuck with with uh how accessible that data is and this is where we see a lot of people adopting node red as an open source project that it gives them the way to just run this alongside their plcs within their environment and capture the data in a much more open way and give them the freedom to do what they want with that data. So, you know, a very typical pattern would be, you know, have um, some, you know, a Node-RED instance or two running on edge devices co-located with your PLCs, being able to provide that first tier of capturing data from the PLCs as well as, you know, other um, equipment within the, the environment. But then um, doing some amount of local processing. And again, it's always great to you know, process the data as near to where it's generated as possible. So um, yeah, you might have built in some um, application logic down at the edge around that capturing of data, um, but then push it back up. So think of like a hierarchy of Node-RED instances where you've got data capture and some sort of you know, ETL type um, you know, cleansing the data, doing some pattern recognition, whatever it might be, more at the edge, then push the higher level events up to, to another tier where you might have um, some more dashboard visualization of that data, or you might at that level want to uh, combine it with data coming from other sources, other locations. Um, so thinking about how you uh, how you architect your flows thinking of, of you know, what makes sense to be done at the edge, what makes sense to be done more at a more central, which could be the cloud, it still could be on premise, you know, it's it's still um, within the environment, but uh, sort of distributing the, the work to where it makes sense to run it. And I mentioned a bit about high availability there. I mean, it, it that's certainly an interesting challenge for when you want to have, um, you know, often these devices, you can't have multiple things, you know, particularly when you talk about hardware sensors, the type, you can't have that sensor plugged into two places. So there are some interesting challenges around how you can ensure availability of data when, when 
you've got quite a tight coupling right down at the edge of how you access that data. So thinking about, um, you know, and I, you know, I, this is kind of true for any IoT application, Node Red or otherwise. But you know, how you architect it to be resilient, um, you know, understanding what data is important. Uh, there might be, yeah, you know, we would always say, you know, if if you're reading the temperature in a room and you miss a reading, don't worry because in ten seconds you'll get the next reading. And it's, you know, that that's a stream of data that that can be uh, can afford to be interrupted. But you know you, there may be more mission critical data streams, and you've got to really got to consider how do we um, protect them, how do we keep them available. And again, I'm, this is kind of there's nothing no dread specific in that, um, and I'm sure a lot of your your viewers will kind of just understand those sorts of principles. But I think it's it's an interesting exercise to think, okay, how does that then translate into a no dread environment, and what what capabilities does no dread give you to to try and help manage that. Awesome. Yeah. So I mean, now as you'd um, as you'd know, really the goal for most uh, industrial companies is to um, collect data uh, and then uh, turn that into information uh, that could be used to 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 make some uh, informed decisions. And a, a crucial step to getting to that stage is is to semantically model the mm. the, the collected data, right? Now, how suitable is Node-RED for this semantic modeling task? Um, it's not something we see a lot of in in my experience being done in Node Red, um, because I think Node Red is great at getting the doing the uh, sort of data gathering, transformation, and sort of passing on type work, or or being more event handling type workloads. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't think we we see a lot of uh, sort of building semantic models explicitly within node red happen um but uh yeah i i do agree i think it, it is a, a fascinating space particularly when you then get into things like digital twins and um other, other models like that I've, I've certainly seen people build digital twin type systems within node red um how successful they are i, I couldn't say <laughs> but yeah. um but yeah i think it's a it is a rich space and you know ultimately node red is a development platform to build whatever you can imagine and um yeah i think uh if there's there's it'd be really interesting to see what what works and what doesn't work in that space in the node red context okay interesting now in that um uh, a space where uh, node red like kind of like really shines uh which is like data collection and management at the edge uh there are some of the shelf tools uh, that perform more or less the same tasks. Now, what are your thoughts on such tools compared uh, to not red, uh, particularly for industrial IoT mm. use cases? Do, do, do you think there will always be room for uh, coexistence, or, or do you imagine, like as I do sometimes, that uh, not red will at some point eat everything up? <laughs> what are your thoughts there? <laughs> I, I I'm probably too modest to. Right. to want to say but no i i think um if if the history of the project has taught me anything it's the the fact we've made no dread an open it is an open source openly governed project um so uh yeah it, it's funny I, I often still see no dread described as ibm's no dread whereas you know the fact is no dread is part of the open js foundation so this is a uh um, part a foundation beneath the Linux Foundation that helps provide open governance to the project, which means it, it isn't driven or owned by any one company. It is an open platform, and it's that openness as well. The fact we we don't gatekeep who can create a new node, who can add more functionality to Node Red, and I certainly find that that has been one of the great successes of the Node Red community is. Uh, if someone finds something they can't do with Node Red, they can write the node to, to enable that bit of functionality. And I think it's that extensibility of an open platform um, that you know, open source is is going to win. Um, <laughs> I think I, that said, I, I I think there will always be space for um, you know 
closed source off the shelf solutions that are very focused on very specific use cases because they can focus on very specific scenarios. But just in terms of ease of extensibility and flexibility, uh, you know, Node-RED uh, is, has, I think has the edge as an open source project that has such an active community of people adding nodes, creating nodes, um, and and just building solutions that work with it. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, so you you have uh, um, kind of like described uh, the 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 need to understand where to deploy like a Node Red instance within um, a, a stack, right? And there are circumstances where Node Red is deployed like in the cloud, and some scenarios where it's in the edge. Uh, can you give us uh, insights into uh, what informs the, the decision to either deploy Node Red in the cloud or mm -hmm. to have it run at the edge? I, it it all depends on the workload. And I think, as I mentioned, it, it depends where your data is and what sort of work you need to do. So um, uh, there are, um, it's particularly in the industrial sense, there are, you have to, you have to be very conscious of where your data is going. And for some customers or um, some organizations, they will have very strict controls on their data, which that help, certainly helps inform in terms of you know where are they happy for their data? Are they happy for their data to leave their network and uh, yeah, go to a, a cloud service? Um, so it's all those sorts of considerations that help inform it. At a more technical level, a sort of solution building level, um, as I say, with and again, this is this is my sort of my MQTT heritage shining through. I always see this as you know, it's a hierarchy of systems. You have, um, you know, you you don't send, you know, when you've got a sensor set, sending data ten times a second, you don't send ten readings a second up to your cloud environment. You you think of it as a you know, it is this hierarchy. You you handle that ten readings a second as close to where it's being generated as possible. And that's the raw data. And then the information of, you know, the average temperature has risen or lowered, you know, go from the data to the information, push the information up. And then at the next tier, turn that information to the knowledge of, of what's happening as a trend and, um, and you know, go on from there. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, yeah, and, and there's also just those practicalities of, as Node-RED is so flexible and can talk to lots of different systems, you need to run it where the, it can reach those other systems or those other systems can reach it. So uh, we see a lot of people building, um, you know, not absolutely not limited to the industrial IoT scenarios, but building solutions that listen to web hooks. You know, maybe you're building, I don't know, uh, an integration with Stripe for your system and you need to listen to their callbacks whenever a payment system goes through or whatever it might be you need to have something that is on the public cloud and you need to be running it so that those other cloud systems can reach it um so yeah it, it is again this isn't a necessarily no dread specific answer but it, it all depends on on the architecture of the solution you're building and what you need to reach but as i say uh i i'm always a big prompt for you know, push push your processing logic as close to the source of the data as possible um and you know just you know make best use of the resources at the right point in that hierarchy interesting now scalability is a, a big concern when it comes to um, uh, large scale industrial iot deployments um uh, can you share best practices on how to uh, ensure uh, scalability of node red mm -hmm. deployment in, in such scenarios absolutely so it's uh it's a really interesting topic, and it, it's one that we're looking at quite closely at Flowforge at the moment, trying to work out, uh, frankly, where the gaps are with with what you can easily achieve with Node-RED today. So, um, the the um, typical approach to scaling: what once you feel you are exhausting the the capabilities of a single Node-RED instance, is being able to run multiple instances. Put some load balancing in front of it. You know, scale horizontally scaling an application. It's it's you know kind of a, a standard practice. One of the interesting challenges with Node Red is um, load balancing inbound work 
like it, you know, load balancing HTTP requests on the web server, that's a super well understood problem and um, you know, plenty of solutions for that. One of the interesting things with Node-RED is when your flows have outbound connections and um, how, how can you load balance work across multiple instances when it's the individual instances are reaching out for the work rather than the work being given to them. So, you know, MQTT based workloads, you know, MQTT v5, we added shared subscriptions um, to help with exactly that type of scenario. So you can um, distribute work more evenly. Um, if you're, uh, yeah, so it, it kind of all depends on the, the style of work you're trying to achieve. Um, but I would say, you know, the, the throughput of a single Node-RED instance is, uh, shouldn't be uh, underestimated, if you like, that you can go a long way. And, and as I said, this is why we're looking at DHA scenarios, both from a um, availability of, yeah. of the flows, as well as how, how can you then scale them to, to handle higher workloads. And again, it goes back to this idea, I think, of um, architecting your system as a hierarchy. So the at each level you're sort of reducing by reducing the amount of data down to more uh insight and you know uh sort of distribute how that workload is is managed across the system rather than trying to focus it all in on a single point of application awesome now, another topic of great concern um, uh, for a lot of uh, industrial organization is that of uh, security. Uh, can, you, can you share insights into how node -RED allows for uh, management of security aspects, such as, um, I mean, you've already mentioned access control, mm -hmm. data encryption, and, and things like authentication. So the node -RED runtime itself has, uh, you know, integrated user-based security so you can lock it down very closely as to who can uh, edit the flows who can view the flows who has access so that that has been you know a, a core part of node red for for a very long time and you know that we see that as being um the key to building a, a properly secure environment in terms of thing topics like data encryption um items like that we kind of see that as more a flow level concern, sort of an application level concern, than something that the Node-RED runtime itself uh, can take responsibility for. So there's, um, uh, yeah, so it is one of those where you have to kind of build your flow to meet the, the requirements that you, you may have in terms of, you know, if, you're, if your flow is writing to a database, then, well, you need to make sure the database has got you know, on disk encryption setup that that isn't that isn't that's beyond the scope of what node red is is um able to do um so yeah i think it's it's recognizing you know, node red is a part of your solution it, it's it's doing the integration between the different systems um and you kind of have to those different systems have to work in tandem to to uh, provide that end-to-end -end security awesome yeah, so uh, now just to kind of like paint a picture for uh, some of the uh, audience members who may be wondering a, a typical use case, um, do you have uh, by any chance an example of a successful industrial IoT project where Node-RED was used that you could share? Um, uh, it's one of those, um, some of the more interesting ones are ones I'm not in a position to share, yeah, okay. but um, certainly I, I can talk about some that, that your listeners will be able to find references to, to um, online. So there's there's a um, a clothing company here in the UK called Rapa Nui who are uh, have, they started out you know sort of a two man t shirt printing business type of thing, very small scale, uh, but they hand built their factory in an old shop with a lot of uh, so sort of industrial t-shirt printing and um, yeah, other other machines in in the whole system, and they've they have built for themselves basically they've automated the whole factory in terms of um, you know when an order comes in printing order labels um, they've got um, uh, um, 
conveyor belts the baskets go down as order clipped and those baskets get rooted to different stations and it's it's i mean i've visited them and it 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 just feels like an engineer's engineer's playground of (laughs) just being able to build this big lego machinery of of a a really and you know they've they've grown they've got like four or five factories now um and it is no dread running on raspberry pies uh, automating all of these different aspects of of their business and it was um it was great to see to the extent when we paid them a visit uh a few years ago now um probably three years ago now they still had an original raspberry pi on the wall yeah. hanging from its power lead with just the label saying you know do not turn off and that raspberry pi although at that point in time it was no longer the brain of the entire factory it, you know for in the early days, this one Raspberry Pi had been sort of the brain running this whole business with through no dread. But um, it's just awesome to see that uh, they have been able to build this and make themselves a very successful company um, through that level of automation and the fact they could do that with no dread as an open source project, you know, um, and they could build that for themselves. To the other extreme, um, Again, without I can't name names, talk about specifics, but there are um, there are theme parks in the world where you know you often get those um, wristbands that let you tap in, and yeah. um, well, that there, there is a particular theme park where every time you tap in, you're interacting with No Dread, and it's it is um, yeah a lot of the interactive elements of that theme park are running through node red on um i don't know if it's raspberry pis or <laughs> some other you yeah. know, uh, what small computer but again to another extreme of of i mean that i just find that that that's an awesome use case and you would never know and then that's one of the ones i can't get talk about who that is because they don't talk around how they build their solutions type of thing and um but yeah you know we but we have just within the Node-RED community, when we see companies like Siemens, Hitachi, yeah. um, with uh, yeah, they, they all have Node-RED-based solutions. They all are um, supporters of the project. There's a ton of stuff going on out there using Node-RED in industrial IoT that that is fascinating. And yeah, I I would I always love to hear the stories. So I mean, I, I would appeal to your to your listeners that if you've got a no dread story to share then please do you know join us in the community and, and share your story because you know i i would love again we're an open source project and we decide what shapes what we do is is what the community feeds back to us and and getting better insight into how people are using no dread is so key to us helping uh keep it in headed in the right direction so you know i i would I would directly appeal to your listeners. If you've got a Node-RED story to tell, please do get in touch with us and, and share your story. Absolutely. I would imagine there are a lot of fascinating stories about Node-RED out there. So we we'll certainly love to hear about those stories as well. So mm-hmm. well, now, uh, what do you see as uh, being the future uh, uh, of Node-RED in industrial IoT? Like when you look into the future, how, what, what do you envision? How do you envision uh, Node Red is going to like sort of like evolve? What do you see as being the role of Node Red in industrial IT in the future? So, I, I again, this is the one where I, I do struggle with my my British modesty. But yeah, time and time again, I just hear I do hear these stories about how so much is being done with Node Red out there and how just pervasive it is becoming um, in the area. So. I think there is a degree of sort of inevitability of of it just continuing to get adopted and being um, uh, just its use, usage growing and just becoming so much more just a standard tool available. And again, I you know, I recognise Node Red is just one tool amongst many that that people turn to. You know, I, I'm uh, I, it's not going to solve every problem under the sun, but it does a really good job at the problems it does solve. And we would also love to hear more about where it does fall short and how we can improve it. And again, you know, 
linking this back to to Flowforge and the work we're doing around DevOps and you know trying to trying to provide that platform that can just help um, take Node Red from being something lots of people love to use but perhaps feel uh, slightly hesitant to try and use it in production or to try and get the formal approvals of 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 you know, the, the organization to actually adopt it. Um, yeah, I certainly see that that's the opportunity we have with Flowforge. And we see time and time again of trying to build this platform that gives Node Red the 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 backing and the um uh just all the all those sorts of qualities that just help it become much more pervasive than it already is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for me, I think really Node Red is an important uh, project, just just by the fact that uh, it, it allows like um, a, a new breed of of talented people who would otherwise not even had, had interest to to venture into industrial IT to kind of like explore that space. You know, so I think there's a a lot to come out of there. A lot of innovations that we're yet to see. Especially yep. with all this new uh, innovation of uh, and a new breed of uh, integrators coming into the into the picture. So yeah, I mean to conclude this section, uh, Nick, can you tell us more about uh, Flowforge, the company, and also about your service offering? Of course. So as mentioned, um, so Flowforge is the company I started uh, two years ago now, um, based on essentially seeing this opportunity in. The IoT space, industrial IoT, of um, having seen how Node Red is being adopted, but seeing the types of problems that people were having to solve for themselves in order to adopt Node Red, um, an opportunity to build something that just just works and just does that for you. So, you know, how do you manage when you want to have a hundred Node Red instances, and how do you organize your uh, your users into the teams as who can access what and all those sorts of qualities. So this is what we're building with, with the Flowforge platform, really trying to bring those DevOps sensibilities to, um, to Node-RED, being able to manage not just um, the Node-RED instances running within the platform, but also being able to remotely manage Node-RED instances running on devices or uh, you know, systems outside of the immediate bounds of the Flowforge platform. Um, and yeah, give, giving you all those sorts of capabilities. We're building it as an open source project um, so that the core of Flowforge, our community edition is open source, uh, free to use. Then we have our sort of enterprise version that uh, unlocks a variety of more sort of enterprise oriented features around um, uh, well, yeah, that 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 you need if you want to take it beyond the sort of individual use cases of of Flowforge. So, um, that's what we're building. Uh, we've got Flowforge Cloud, which is uh, um, people can sign up to today. So, this is an instance of the Flowforge platform running um, in the cloud that users can sign up to today. Get a thirty day free trial. Um, get Node Red applications running um, in the cloud. Get devices running, connected, and and managed from from the uh, from that cloud, but but that you know, Flowforge Cloud is just our hosted instance of it to let people play with the platform and, and get started quickly. Um, but we certainly see, as we've talked about in the industrial scenarios, uh, a lot of people want to be able to self-host and manage it within their own firewall. Frankly, so we are building Flowforge as something that people can install and run for themselves as as a as a way to manage Node-RED within their own environment. So um yeah, so it it's it's a lot of fun. Um we're we're building it as an open project. We have new releases every four weeks. Um we've got you know regular we do regular ask me anything sessions on Node-RED and webinars. So do check out flowforge.com for for all of that good stuff that we're up to um and yeah we're we are um i mean from my perspective it it affords me the ability to also focus on node red and be able to keep the node red project moving forward 
and keep it sustainable to to help continue to deliver. So within Flowforge, yes, we're developing the Flowforge platform, but we're also feeding back upstream. You know, I sort of take off my Flowforge hat and put my Node Red hat on, and you know, yeah. work, work on Node Red open source work as well. So, um, and that's that's a lot of fun. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I I I read uh, somewhere that you uh, recently raised some funding. Are you, you're venture backed, right? Yes. So so we're venture backed. We got our seed funding um, towards well in the autumn last year. So we're in a, a great position. I and mean, we've got a growing team. I think there's uh, nine, ten of us today um, working on this, which is um, a lot of fun. And, you know, I started Flowforge on the back of a 19-year a career at IBM. So it's, it's um, you yeah, know, been a lot of fun being, you know, building this from the ground up, um, building a, an organization, trying to build a company that's that's fun to work in um and uh is you know and that we are trying you know we want to be successful in what we're building because i think there's there's a lot of promise here for for both the node community and you know in the industrial iot space for for what we're building yep absolutely i wish you all the best that you are doing really important work for the uh, community so thank you so much for all your efforts and so that brings us to the end uh, of this session. Uh, Nick, thank you again for taking the time to come out onto the show and uh, share your insights with the audience. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kelsey. Enjoyed our chat. Thank you. Thank you.